Hey guys, Dalek44 here. One of the things I've noticed, like, from when I did my Q&A response video and my Thomas Around the World in 80 Days commentary, was that people seem to like those things, like, things that are unscripted or, like, facts about myself. People really seem to like that. So I decided to do something else like that. And today I've counted down my top 15 comedic influences. Uh, these are the big comedic influences that have had the most impact on me growing up. And I actually tried to keep it at top 10, but it went up to top 15, but whatever, this is my video, I can do what I bloody well like. So, yeah guys, these are my top 15 comedic influences. Number 15. The Chuckle Brothers. These were some of the earliest things I've seen while watching the CBBC channel. And I love the Chuckle Brothers, they're, they're really funny. Well, they were funny back in the day, like... And one of the catchphrases I loved from them was the To me, to you, to me, to you thing. You know, that always made me laugh, and... And I love how whenever something bad happens, they go, Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, that's just really funny to hear. And I think I might have seen a stage show years ago when I was a kid of them of them going to sleep at some old mansion somewhere with like a shining night armor or whatever and every time they went to bed they they just like said goodnight to Wayne in a stupid way I think it was like something like 1990 pajama pajama well at least I think that was the Chuckle Brothers but I'm not really sure it might have been anyway and another thing I love about the Chuckle Brothers is the character no slacking he's just a brilliant villain for the brothers and and the fact that there's millions of him everywhere they go. It's like, everywhere the Chunkle Brothers go, there's always a no slacking. It's like they're all distant relatives or something like that. And it's obvious that the Scottish version of him is a relative. Like, Lacken Muck Slacken. Yeah, I like that. And I also like the character Get Out Of It, for, who's famous for his catchphrase, Get Out Of It. And that's, it's just a funny thing to watch, like, these two villains who have a grudge against the Chuckle Brothers just because they get things wrong. And that's really funny. So, yeah, the Chuckle Brothers love them. Number 14. Ed, Ed and Eddie. I don't think there was a moment where I didn't watch an Ed, Ed and Eddie episode. I, I loved that show. It was, it was one of the best Cartoon Network shows of all time before... Cartoon Network went downhill with its rubbish shows. And with Ed, Ed and Eddie, they're kind of... It's kind of one of the main influences for Second Coat. Well, mainly because of Eddie being the moneymaker who wants to make money and all that. And Ed is obviously an influence for Slavine because of his stupidity and all that. And as you remember, I once did an influence scene with... Slavine dressing up as Ed and saying, but the toast and all that. Yeah, I, yeah, I had to do that. And Cyber's kind of related to Double D. Not the, not the, not the brainiac type of thing. I mean, like, the sensible one who's, like, questioning the abilities of Eddie's ideas. Like, thinking, like, should I be doing this? Or is this actually going to work? Or is it going to backfire, you know? And some of the other characters I love are Johnny 2x4, because he's one of the funniest characters on the show, especially working off his imaginary friend, Plank. And, and he's really funny. One of my favourite moments from Johnny is from the pet cleaning episode when millions of bunnies were multiplying over the cul-de-sac, and, and Johnny's like, Plank, I told you bunnies would take over the world, and they have! Lucky we prepared for this day, huh, Plank? That, that's one of the funniest things I've heard Johnny say. And he gets up to all sorts of stupid things, like Captain Melonhead and, and letting Plank be a tractor motor or whatever. And, and Ralph's a funny character too, because you don't really know what country he comes from. All you know is that he's foreign and he, he like has weird eating habits like squids and all that, but... But he's still a funny character. He's, yeah, well, a lot of them are funny, and I mean, those characters, including Naz and the Kanker Sisters, are like the only ones that you get to like in the show. I mean, if I'm honest, 
Kevin's a prick, Sarah's a bitch, Jimmy's a pussy, and Eddie's brother became a likeable character as well. I mean, he looks exactly like Eddie, except he's an older version of him and he sounds different. And it's also the schemes that they come up with to make money. It's like, like pet cleaners or, or pesky problem fixers or, or a telephone or, or, or whatever. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, all those ideas are brilliant. One of my favourite episodes for Meredith and Eddie is when the urban rangers go into the woods for a camping trip and the Eds follow them with the intention of scaring the crap out of them, you know? And then Ralph ends up scaring the crap out of the Eds and I love how they seem to think that he's the belly button eater that Johnny's been telling the story about. And I love that belly button eater thing. It's, it's just hilarious and I may use that for one of my future videos. So, edit in any great cartoon, I'll never forget it. Number 13. Tom and Jerry. This was one of those early cartoons I watched where there's cartoon violence, like getting smashed in the face with baseball bats or hit in the head with an ammo or just shot with a gun. And yeah, there's just a pure lust for violence in these characters. And out of both Tom and Jerry, Tom's my favourite character because he's the one who's always getting injured. It's, it's just so funny to see him get injured. And there's a lot of funny things about Tom, like his scream whenever he's like, whenever he chops his own tail off or whenever he's hit his foot, his, his screams are hilarious. And a lot of people are saying that it was Bill Hanna who did those screams and, and I'm not really sure if he did, I haven't really checked on Wikipedia. And... Another funny thing about Tom is his eyebrows. He has such mean eyebrows that makes you want to see him get injured. But you also sympathise with the fact that he either wants to get a meal or stop Jerry from whatever it is he's doing. But you don't pity him enough to not want to see him get injured. And I also love it whenever Tom thinks he's won the day when he does his little smile and goes <laughs> and sticks his chin out. And that's just hilarious because it's obviously saying hit me, you know, he's saying, come on, hit me, I'm so confident you're not going to be able to hit me or apply any damage or whatever, and then, I don't know, he gets hit in the face with an anvil or something, and it's just brilliant timing that comes from these cartoons, like, the way they get injured and the expressions Tom has before he gets injured, you know, some people go like, huh? But Tom seems to have these meaner faces, he's like, huh? Right before he gets injured, and it actually does look like they got injured, Unlike in some cartoons like Tiny Toons where someone gets hit in the face and, is, and their face expands and wobbles about, that, that's not completely funny. It has to look solid. It, it has to look like they really got injured. And, and Tom and Jerry just had that brilliant timing and uh, I don't think anybody ever forgets that. So Tom and Jerry, brilliant cartoon. Number 12. The Young Ones. The Young Ones is one of those early 80s British comedies I got introduced to during my teen years. And they're just completely crazy and hilarious, you know. These these characters are so crazy and hilarious. Like Rick, played by Rick, surprisingly enough, he's the he's the peace loving maniac who tends to shout and and pick on Neil. Yeah. Yeah, he's just a brilliant character. He's like one of the only... He's the, one of the very funny characters in the show. Because he hates everybody else, but has a little bit of respect for Mike. And Vivian the Bastard, he, he's, a, he's this complete bastard in the show, and that's why I think he's funny. Like, it's pure lust for violence and you know, smashing through walls and doors and... And destroying inanimate objects and and he obviously has a hatred for Neil and Rick I mean he has no problem with smashing them in the face or whacking them in the nuts and, and that's another thing I love about Rick when he got hit in the nuts by Vivian with a baseball bat he he didn't actually scream in pain because he got his nuts hit he just said haha missed both my legs <laughs> and I remember seeing a a desk video by Turbo J when he did that little scene. And I also love the cricket thing when 
Mike accidentally smashes Neil in the face with a cricket bat and they're like, what's that worth a six? Six? No, it would have been six if he killed him. And Turbo J obviously did that bit as well, but I'd have, didn't, I'd have given you a nine if you killed him. <laughs> it's just hilarious. And speaking of which, Neil is the hippie and he's one of the best characters as well along with all the others. Because he's like this good-hearted man who tries to kill himself at times but for some reason at times he never brings himself to actually doing it at times like there was one episode where he digs a grave for himself but tends to but he decides to not kill himself on that day and in another episode called blood when they were gonna kill Viv, when they were gonna kill neil and eat him just because there was a flood and they had no food and Neil sounded like he actually didn't want to get killed and eaten. And then there's Mike, the cool person. And I love Mike. And I'm not just saying that because the actor who played him also played the Sontaran in Doctor Who. No, no, he, Mike's just a brilliant character. He thinks he's the leader of everything. He thinks he's in charge of the boys and the place they live in. And I also love the Belosky family members. They're, they're completely crazy. Especially since they're played by the same actor. And the actor who plays them... Uh, I can't really remember his name. Uh, the actor who plays them is hilarious. And he tends to break out of character at times and break the fourth wall. And that's hilarious. There's a lot of breaking the fourth wall jokes in the young ones. And I tend to use a lot of breaking the fourth wall jokes in my videos. And I love it. I love the young ones. They're brilliant. Number 11. Matt Lucas and David Wannings. Now, with this comedy duo, I love them most for the Little Britain decade. Because they play so many hilarious characters, like like Andy and Lou and Vicky Pollard, David Thomas, Anne, and Kenny Craig. They're all really funny. And when they were doing USA, they created some American characters, and... I wasn't too keen on a lot of the American characters, but there were some American characters I did like. Like Phyllis Church and Mr. Doggy and and the eighth man on the moon. Yeah, I love some of the characters and 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 Little Britain Abroad is also funny. Like the thought of all those characters from Britain going to different countries is it's just hilarious. And I also but I love a lot of the Andy and Lou sketches the most. It's mainly because Andy will do such crazy things while Lou's not looking, like beating up kids just because they take the mick out of him, climbing up trees to get a ball back, and then claiming that he's fallen up the tree when Lou gets back, or and cheating to get a strike at bowling, or go for a swim, or whatever, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. And... I did watch the show Come Fly With Me, but I didn't really find it as funny as Little Britain. It was, uh, well, don't get me wrong, it was funny, but just not as funny. Now, having said that, there were some funny characters in Come Fly With Me. I, there was Precious, the coffee shop owner. I just find it funny how she comes up with the most... How she sabotages her own shop, and, like, just so that she can have the day off work and waste her money on stupid things like gambling or shows and like stage shows and all that and one of the other sketches I loved from Come Fly With Me was the British Battle Reenactment Society thing I mean the British Medieval Battle Reenactment Society sketch where where two men from the BMBRF were trying to travel to France so they could reenact the Battle of Agincourt but they weren't allowed to take their swords onto an airplane and they were becoming very angry with the stewardess. And they end up walking away in a rage of anger just because they wouldn't let them. And I think it's funny how how one of them claimed that they would immediately surrender if the Germans invaded France again. Because, because I find it funny how people tend to take the mick out of the French just because of their differences and how they fought wars against them and how he beat them in several wars and how he saved them in other wars 
But the Little Britain decade was definitely the best of Matt Lucas and David Williams, so they're both brilliant guys. Number 10. Robot Chicken. Now, with Robot Chicken, the, the first ever Robot Chicken sketch I saw was on YouTube of Fred and Barney like fighting over a, a box of cereal and Barney ends up killing him. And then I got into it a bit more after I watched the first Star Wars special. Uh, I think it's hilarious the way they portray these classic characters like showing what they might be like behind the like uh, outside the television and that's just brilliant it's especially how they portray Palpatine as this like the guy who just wants to rule the galaxy but suffers from Vader being a, a, a like a worthless sidekick and all his clone troops being failures and all that and uh, I especially find it funny that they got Seth MacFarlane to voice him you know, it's just a brilliant show and a lot of the characters from a lot of the characters from Robot Chicken have got more than one sketch per series like Skeletor has been in the show all the way through and so have the Smurfs and Batman and all that yeah you know, you know, it's like they want to continue doing sketches of those characters but I can understand that there's there's so much you can do with these characters like like when they're not being shown on TV like with the Hanna-Barbera characters and and uh, and pretty much all the characters and and I think one of the craziest sketches was the Looney Tunes sketch when they turn into the live Looney to zoom spin like Daffy Duck and Bee Rabbit and all that and Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd rapping that's just that's just funny like like saying what they hate about each other like just because Bugs Bunny's a cross dress dresser that might make him gay and 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 how Elmer Fudd's pronouncing his R's like W's annoys Bugs Bunny. I, I just found that really funny. And how Porky Pig portrayed the That's All folks by changing it to That's All Bitches. Yeah, I don't think that's really intended for children. Because Daffy said that they were trying to appeal to today's kids. But that doesn't really sound like it's appealing to kids. It sounds more like it's appealing to adults. But... That's why I love the show a lot. It's it's just hilarious. Uh, Robot Chicken, I love the show. Number nine. The Simpsons. Now with The Simpsons, I love the classic series more, like from like from before the movie aired. Now the, now I actually do love the film. Like I love how the film is portrayed. Like, but. To be honest, I was actually expecting the villain of the film to be Sideshow Bob in another crazy attempt to kill Bart Simpson, but you can't really have everything, can you? Now, with The Simpsons, in the first uh, ten-ish years, I think, it's, I think those were the most popular episodes, like with uh, Family and several other characters getting up to all sorts of silly antics. And Springfield is like the city that tolerates this idiocy. Like Homer does something stupid and Marge and Lisa are the only ones who like regret it and think that it will embarrass them and everybody else just seems to tolerate it. And one of my favourite Simpsons episodes is 22 short films about Springfield. Because I find it hilarious how they showed the various antics of many people in Springfield. Like... Like how Superintendent Chalmers goes to Skinner's house for dinner and he ends up buying the takeaway just because he burnt his roast. And and I find it hilarious how he just left his roast to burn in the oven and just left it to burn the house down. That's, that's hilarious. And another creative scene from them was, was from the Krusty Burger scene with Chief Wiggum and the other police officers. And... They're just talking about McDonald's and the differences between McDonald's and Krusty Burger. I mean, that's a really good idea, like saying how McDonald's would be different to Krusty Burger. That is very brilliant. And plus Maggie Simpson, I think she's one of the funniest characters in the show. I don't think there was one moment where Maggie Simpson wasn't funny. So yeah, the Simpsons in his early years, love it. 
Number eight, John Cleese. Now with John Cleese, I love him more for when he was in Faulty Towers. He's like playing this really mean hotel manager who just wants to get his work done and thinks his life would be better if it wasn't for the hotel guests. And a lot of people who work in hotels or shops or whatever have kind of been there where they have to deal with customers who complain, but they sort of have to tolerate it. And John Cleese, I mean, Basil, John Cleese as Basil Fawlty just like lets out his anger, like showing how much he hates the guests, thinking that they're a nuisance and they're just leeching off him. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. And. The first time I actually saw John Cleese was in the film Rat Race, where he's Donald Sinclair, the billionaire, who's betting loads of other billionaires that those that the other characters could get to Silver City, New Mexico, and keep two million dollars and, and all that, you know. And I was introduced to a couple of the Monty Python sketches. The first Monty Python film I've seen was The Holy Grail, where John Cleese plays the Black Knight and Sir Lancelot. The first ever sketch from Monty Python, not from the films I've seen, was was the Argument Clinic, where John Cleese was the Argument Clinic, and some other actor came in for an argument, and they just argue about the differences between an argument and a contradiction. It's, it's really create as a really good idea, and uh, I got introduced to that sketch because of a remake Miss Oliver and Blossom did, and so John Cleese is a funny guy. Number seven, David Jason. With David Jason, I love him more for Only Falls and Horses, which a lot of you already knew, I suppose. And Only Falls and Horses was one of the inspirations to create Second Co. Like, like people who are trying to make it through in life by trying to become millionaires. And I think it's obvious that that Del Boy is sort of an inspiration for Dalek Sec. Like that he who dares wins kind of guy and always trying to make money but often failing and Cyber's almost like Votney like sort of questioning sex ideas like will this work and all that and Slippin's obviously the stupid one and I introduced a little bit of Grandad in him if you may already know like the playing the talking chess game and burning sex food and well, I just, I just love how Grandad in Only Falls and Horses burns everything that he cooks. But I'm going slightly from the point. David Jason is a funny guy, and I've also heard his voice in the 80s TV series of Wind in the Willows when he was Mr. Toad, Billy the Bunny, and the Chief Weasel. Yeah, he's just really brilliant. He can actually play a Londoner and a posh man and make him funny. He's really brilliant at that. I, I love David Jason. He's just a brilliant actor. Number six. Eric Thompson. With Eric Thompson, I love him most for The Magic Roundabout. What a surprise. Now, Eric Thompson obviously took these French episodes from France and just made up his own stories that fitted what was happening on the screen. And he did it really well. He actually gave the show a British feel, and to be honest, uh, before I heard that the Magic Roundabout was from France, I didn't even know it was from France. I thought it was an English show because the characters from Eric Thompson's mouth are the characters I know, and I love Dougal the most from Magic Roundabout. He's he's a lovable dog who comes up with these crazy ideas and like standing for Parliament or. Uh, creating a hair growth experiment and all that and and you may have seen one of my episodes of Second Co that was based on the episode Caravan and the video that was based on Vote for Dougal they're two of my favourite Magic Roundabout stories that I memorised when I was little and uh, and I recently and as you may know I got the film Dougal and the Blue Cat on DVD for Christmas a few years ago and and I had to get that DVD because it was one of my childhood memories, like something nostalgic that's stuck with me for years. And I find it a bit of a shame that they haven't released the classic series yet, but 
They may do in the future, and if they did, I'd definitely buy it. it it'll be worth the money. So, Eric Thompson, he's a funny guy, and, and I love his work. Number five. Hanna-Barbera. With Hanna-Barbera, I love a lot of their cartoons. I watched a lot of the Hanna-Barbera cartoons when I was a kid, like Scooby-Doo and Wacky Races, and Dick Dastardy and Muttley and their flying machines, and Pels at Penelope Pitstop, Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Snagglepuss, Quick Draw McGraw, and Sneezy and Breezy, and Pitsy and Ditsy and Mr. Jinx and all that. And I love all those cartoons. These characters are so unforgettable. And I also find it creative how they can how they mixed in a lot of the popular characters together, like Yogi Bear with Huckleberry Ham, Snagglepuss, and Doggy Daddy, and and his son. You know, the first ever Hanna Barbera feature length film I've seen was Hey There It's Yogi Bear. I just find that a funny film, like how there's more than one thing going on in the film, and there's more than one protagonist and all that. And, and the recent Yogi Bear film sort of doesn't have that charm that the original film had. There could have been more than one thing going on. I mean, there was more than one thing going on in the original film. Why couldn't they have the same in the new film? But never mind, Hanna-Barbera is one of those... Hanna-Barbera had great cartoons of my childhood and I'll never forget them. They're, they're just brilliant. Number four. Family Guy. This show is one of the funniest adult comedies I have seen in years. I mean, they could go seriously over the top with the comedy of like what you can of what you can do in a comedy show and an animated comedy show at that. And Stewie Griffin was always my favorite character because I find it funny how a like like a one-year-old baby can scheme and think of ways to rule the world and kill his mother. I mean, that's brilliant. And all the characters are memorable, like Peter Griffin's a total idiot, Lois is a smoking hot housewife, Meg's an unattractive girl who gets treated like crap by everyone, even her family, Chris is pretty much as stupid as his dad, but likeable, and Brian, well, Brian's the only sensible one in the family, besides Stewie. I mean, Brian and Stewie have a sort of hate love relationship but it seems to be more love as the years go by and all the other characters are pretty funny as well like quagmire cleveland joe mort goldman and even adam west as the mayor is hilarious i mean he i mean he's incredibly stupid as a mayor but that's why we love him so much i mean you love to see him get up to stupid things like filling up graves with cement because he has a fear of zombies or or dressing up as a London guard to keep watch of Quagmire. And uh, yeah, you enjoy all of those things that West gets up to. It's, it's just hilarious. A few of my favourite episodes of Family Guy are the Road 2 episodes. Because I think those are the ones that bring Stewie and Brian closer together as friends. And I love the Star Wars episodes. Because I love how the characters fit in very well with the original Star Wars characters, like Stewie was the obvious pick for Darth Vader, and I never expected Herbert the Pervert being introduced as Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's just hilarious thinking, you know. <laughs> and, and another one of my favourite episodes is all the ones with James Woods, because he seems to make the perfect villain like he did in Disney's Hercules. I mean, it's funny how he doesn't talk like a traditional villain, but instead talks like a lawyer or agent. He's funny, and he gives a lot of the comedy in the episodes he's in. Especially with the ooh, a piece of candy thing. Yeah, that, I laughed every time he did that. And, and then there were fewer is one of the best episodes, in my opinion. I mean, it's almost as long as a movie. You could treat it like an actual movie. And sometimes I think it should have been a movie for the big screen. But oh well, it's still funny. Yeah, Family Guy, top-notch comedy. Love it. Number three. Daffy Duck. Well, I wouldn't exactly say Daffy Duck in general. I'd say the Looney Tunes were a big emphasis on Daffy Duck. And again, these are some of the earliest things I grew up watching, and I love them. And these, there's so much... 
energy that comes from these cartoons and the timing is brilliant and the animation is top notch and these characters are so funny and the one I love the most is Daffy Duck because he's the loser he's the one who always wants to win and he tries so hard to win but nothing ever goes his way and when you think about why is it because the world is against him the easiest way or is it because he's this way that the world is against him and you can play off either scenario and and at the Warner Brothers studio they were saying that well, the Nostalgia Critic was saying that they're sort of like Disney, but they're doing their own thing. Like, they have the same style animation, but they're doing whatever they want to do. They, they're they doing what they think is funny. And a lot of the best comedy comes from that. Do what makes you laugh, and don't worry about what other people are going to say. And with Daffy Duck, there's two versions of him. And you know, the, the early version is this crazy duck who's jumping up and down, going, hoo, 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 hoo. And there's so much anarchy and silliness that comes out of him. And the more contemporary one that I know is The Jealous Jerk. And I love both. I think it's brilliant that there's two versions of the character because it actually did work that way because Daffy Duck was going to be the big star. You know, for a while Porky Pig was going to be the big star. Then when Daffy Duck came in, he took over the spotlight and became really big. And then Bugs Bunny came along and he became a superstar and Daffy wasn't as popular. So you can sort of identify with his frustrations, you know. Yeah, I love both. I love the anarchy and silliness, but... I really love this jealous jerk who wants to be the star and wants to be appreciated by everyone and for some reason nothing ever goes his way and the harder he tries to make things go his way the bigger it blows up in his face and I think that's why we like it that these things happen to him because he's obviously trying to take something away from someone else and he knows he's doing it and has no problem with it he'd almost think it'd be better that way so that's why we have no problem these things happen to him and the cartoon Duck Amuck cracks me up every time I watch it because it's so creative, the idea that Chuck Jones had of an animator messing about with how a cartoon's supposed to be made. And it fits the character really well. Plus, I think it's the first time I've heard a cartoon character refer to the fact that he is a cartoon character in an animated film. It's like he's saying, hey, let me talk to you. I don't really exist. Someone is controlling what I say and what I do and how I look. And you can still believe it's Daffy Duck. Daffy has it in him to want to be appreciated by everyone and to want to be the star. And to me, he really is the star of Looney Tunes. Yeah, yeah, Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny is who I always think of when I think of Looney Tunes. Number two. Animaniacs. Yeah, I could go on forever about why I love Animaniacs, but I'll try and keep it to a minimum. Yeah, Animaniacs is is one of the best cartoon shows by Warner Brothers I've ever seen. Yeah, when I first in when I was first introduced to it, it was almost like the nineties version of the Looney Tunes. I mean it had that same style animation as Looney Tunes and the same uh, comedy timing in it. And so many characters, so many they're so unforgettable, like the Warners and Snappy Squirrel and Pinky in the Brain. And they really had a lot of freedom in those cartoons. They did whatever they wanted to do. Like, they put in so many naughty jokes that adults could understand, but children couldn't understand. And I still don't get that fingerprint joke. Uh, yeah, I never got that, and I still don't get it, but what the hell, it's funny. Yeah, these cartoons are hilarious, and they take advantage of the fact that it is a cartoon, and you can do things that you couldn't do in real life. Like, you couldn't have a... Like, you couldn't have two mice trying to take over the world in real life. Well, I suppose you could, but it wouldn't be as funny. And the idea of Slappy Squirrel being a cartoon character who knows all the tricks and has gotten the dirt on every single cartoon character, that is it's just hilarious. And my favourite characters from Animaniacs have always been the Warners themselves, like Yakko, Wacko and Dot. And uh, I find it funny how people find them a nuisance just because, well, they're crazy. But I never saw them as a nuisance, I just saw them and I still see them as fun-loving rascals who who just want to play and have a friend. Yeah. Yeah, and you can understand that because we were kids once. We were like that. Yeah, we were pretty needy as kids. Yeah. Plus, the guy who like helped write the show, Tom Ruger, had kids and you can understand that, yeah. So, Animaniacs, love it. Best, one of the best shows in the world. And the number one comedic influence is... Rowan Atkinson. Now I'm sure a lot of you already knew this. Now with Rowan Atkinson, I like him better for... 
the earliest things like the Blackadder series. And, and I do like Mr. Bean, don't get me wrong. The first Mr. Bean film I've seen was the Ultimate Disaster movie when he goes to America. But with Blackadder, I love how he's this mean, intelligent, but really mean and pompous man who who thinks he deserves more, but he's not getting anything. And he just makes everyone suffer for it. And you can sort of understand with him because he's so intelligent and you can tell that he wants more, he deserves more, but for some reason he's not getting it. It's probably because of his attitude. And with Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean is funny, but, but Roman Atkinson can make really negative really funny. Like, intelligent and negative funny. And with Mr. Bean, he's like really positive and happy about everything. But he, with Mr. Bean, he's does he does brilliant with the body performances, Mr. Bean. He's almost like a silent character. And and Blackadder's just a jerk who's like punching Baldrick in the face and all that. And Mr. Bean's a jerk as well, but in a childish way. Like in the Christmas episode when he's playing with the nativity set with a dinosaur and all that. You know, he's not doing it to be mean. He's just excited and doesn't know any better. And we were like that as well. We get excited about Christmas. So, in my opinion, when you want physical performance, you go to Mr. Bean. But when you want character, you go to Blackadder. And I also love some of the films that Rowan's been in. Like The Lion King when he voiced Sazu and Rat Race when he did a sort of Italian version of Mr. Bean. I also love the Johnny English movies. They're, they're hilarious. Like taking uh, spy films and turning them into a spy comedy with, with this guy who's intelligent, but he but he just never gets anything right. But in the end, he always comes out on top. He, he, solves, he sorts out the problems in the end. You know, Roman Atkins is just a funny guy. You know, it's, it's amazing how he can take really positive characters and really negative characters and still make them funny. And he's just one of the best comedians I've heard of. So, yeah, guys, those are my top 15 comedic influences. And I know there's more out there, but these are the 15 that have had the most influence on me growing up. And I'm constantly referencing from these. And, yeah, with that, guys, I'll see you later. I'm out of here.